for introducing okay, Black Ayman. He will be speaking from remote. Hi, Blake, are you with us? Yes, you are. Thank you for having me. Please, please turn to, hello, please turn to Blake from remote. Scusate, c'è da condividere Blake da remoto. Okay, one sec, so that everybody in the room can see you. Blake? Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, we hear you. One sec, so that we share your slide here. They're already available online, but not in the room yet. Okay, can you share the slide again? Sorry. Yep, no problem. Okay, that's perfect. You can start. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Blake is from Wisdom Tree. And well, I mean, everybody's talking about ETF today, yesterday, and so it's only appropriate that we have one of the ETF issuer to provide this point of view on the market performance of 2023 and their ability to go forward in 2024. The floor is yours, Blake. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for having me here. Um, just to give a quick background on Wisdom Tree, we are a global asset manager uh, with products listed all across exchanges in the US and Europe. Um, we manage about 100 billion in AUM across equities, fixed income, uh, commodities, digital assets, liquid alternatives. So we really have, you know, really cover the broad spectrum here. Uh, we, we started our digital assets journey um, in 2019 when we launched a Bitcoin ETP uh, in Europe uh, that now has roughly 300 million or so in assets. So when we talk about the Bitcoin ETF in the US and the excitement around that, um, this isn't the first time that we've kind of gone through that process. So very exciting times. And I'll give you a quick um, a quick run through what we're uh, hoping to hit on today and try to stick within the time limits. Um, but all of us are very familiar with the performance of, of the year and, you know, very happy with that, that strong performance of 2023. So we'll kind of recap that as well as start to talk about what to look for in 2024, uh, thinking about the macro perspectives uh, that could be impacting digital asset markets, as well as uh, the adoption, particularly the Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. and how that could be impactful um, and then a few technological advances that, uh, or technological innovations that I'm sure many of you already are already aware of given the nature of this conference, but wanna highlight as you know, exciting opportunities to look forward to in the near future. So with that, let's jump into markets for 2023. So at the start of 2023, if you would have read through a lot of the investment bank forecasts or outlooks for the year, you would have read that many of these firms were forecasting a recession to some, uh, with some probability. That probability was, you know, right around 30% for some companies, higher for others. But the expectation was global recession would fall, fall upon economies, uh, given the fact that we've experienced a, a very quickly uh, appreciating rate hiking cycle uh, through set by central banks across the globe. Uh, throughout uh, throughout 2022 and then continuing through the first half of, of 2023. And looking at markets or asset markets, this would not be any indication that that recession was uh, actually took place, whether or not Europe has actually hit, hit the technical recession mark or not. Uh, markets don't necessarily reflect that. And you can see here equities outperforming. We have the NASDAQ up 50, over 50% 50 on the year, the S&P 500 led by the Magnificent Seven up nearly 25% on the year. Um, so very strong performance for equities. You start to see gold and uh, fixed income also performing positively and leading the pack here are Bitcoin and Ethereum. So you're the two largest digital assets uh, performing in the range of 100% or higher. So very strong performance for digital assets given what should have been a, a, a rocky start to the year and for those that are, you know, maximalists for Bitcoin, 
the, the one thing that is negative on here is a fiat currency, the US dollar index. So if you start to remove the things in the middle, you start to have an interesting take there. Um, but that's just a quick recap on 2023. And to really set the stage looking forward, I wanna at least, there's gonna be a few positive things I talk about um, you know, as we kind of step through the slides here, but I really wanna frame where we're at from like a, a macro perspective uh, and highlight the fact that we are still in a, in a regime where the yield curve is inverted and the yield curve, uh, and you can see the, the indication of the inversion here by the 10 year minus two year yield on the left-hand side, which is the blue line. And you can see when that's below zero, the yield curve is in, inverted. And you start to see those forward looking returns for the equity markets and the broader markets uh, globally, uh, essentially experiencing a downturn. So this, uh, they call this the recession indicator and it's essentially undefeated over a very, very long history, longer than what I have shown here on this 20 year chart. Um, but just to kind of put things in con context, if you go to the right hand side, we are still in an environment where we're in that inverted yield curve we, or we have that inverted yield curve. We've experienced some of the drawdowns that you would expect uh, in 2022. But the key question is for risk assets, for equities, for, the, for broader global markets is are, we, is, are we past that? Or are we expecting you know, another downturn and are there lagged effects of this policy tightening that are still to come that we uh, haven't necessarily experienced yet? And the reason this is important is because we're starting to see uh, a turn of the tide in terms of the actual uh, rates set by central banks. And right now, if you look at the CME Fed Watch tool, which is uh, determined by US federal funds or calculated by US federal funds futures. Um, so the, this is a way of looking at how the market perceives the US Fed funds rate um, being set in the future from the Federal Reserve. And you can see here, that markets are expecting a rate cut as soon as March of this year and rate cuts at almost at every meeting afterwards. And it's a similar story. If you look at the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, you're starting to see reduction in inflation globally, getting closer to those target inflation numbers. And we're at this, we're at is what is deemed as the essentially peak rates. And if we are to see these rates come down in the near future, in the, in the mid to the mid part of the next of this year, that would be beneficial for risk assets like digital assets, which have that high duration, that high risk premium over fixed income, over the over the benchmark rates that are out there that individuals can get for essentially a risk free a risk free rate. So this is one thing that is a, you know a potentially positive impact uh, as we start to see these these rates come down in the near future. Now, shifting gears towards another factor to be mindful of. So we kind of talked a little about the macro and the mixed picture there, given the, the, you know, the, the recession indicator, as well as the, the upcoming expectation of declining rates. Uh, but the other key thing is, which is much more interesting given the news today, is the approval of a US spot Bitcoin ETF. And with spot Bitcoin ETPs or exchange traded products being available in Europe for some years now, as well as for those of us that are crypto native, uh, you know, why is this interesting to people there? You know, everybody should just, you know, own a wallet and, you know, manage their funds themselves. That's kind of the, the thesis of crypto, right? Um, so much of the population is not at that stage. So to actually get comfortable with that, there needs to be a solution that people can access today. And the, and the exchange traded product or the exchange traded fund is, is one of those solutions. It's been available, like I said, it's been available for a while in Europe and in the US it has not been available. And the key thing why this is exciting in the US is because this opens up the door for retirement funds to allocate to this exciting new asset class, uh, specifically Bitcoin. And when you start to run the numbers here, you'll start to, and I'm sure you've seen it in the news uh, over the last several weeks, you start to see these forecasts of Bitcoin prices based off of the overall adoption here. And the expectation is that, you know, over time, people are going to get more comfortable with it. They're going to start to understand how much to allocate in a portfolio. And if they start to allocate, say, a 1% allocation, you could understand how this would impact uh, positive price 
in the near or in the medium to long term future. So, you know, you start to think about 1% of that 35 or 1% of that 35 trillion, that's 350 billion. You start to see that, you know, a fraction of that ends up, uh, if a fraction of that ends up being allocated, um, you could start to see how, say, 100 billion in the, added to the current market cap of Bitcoin could increase the price by, you know, say, $10,000 or something like that. So, you start to back out and do some some back of the envelope math. You can start to come up with some numbers, you know, holding everything you know else constant, and that's the that's the key there. If you're holding everything else constant, you know, there's so many assumptions there, but nonetheless, this is a huge development for the space because it's now becoming accessible to so many individuals that did not have access before, um, particularly because of the the hoops people had to go through in terms of adopting new compliance systems, adopting um, you know, new, uh, you know, integrating with, you know, new technologies for, you know, working with the wallets, et cetera. This, the, the, the ETF structure and the ETP structure plugs into the current brokerage system, the current, um, the current systems that, you know, institutional investors that are managing this money are already operating on. So this is a huge development for, for, the, for the space. And many of us have been watching this for quite a while. Now, when I mentioned that 1% allocation, um, that's something that is is something that's something that drives a lot of the conversations we have as asset managers, uh, because the first question is is once you get somebody beyond the fact of understanding the investment case of Bitcoin for this, uh, you know, obviously a global payment system, the, uh, the the hedge against fiat currency debasement, et cetera. Once you get people on board with this this concept, then people ask, okay, if I'm ready to allocate, how much should I even think about allocating, right? So we started to do some analysis here and structure and structure it out uh, based off of a passive market cap weighted type of portfolio. So if you take all the global listed assets that an investor might be interested in and market cap weight and essentially asking them to not take a view, they're just going to buy the market, as you will that digital asset slice becomes roughly 1%. And if you start to look at how that 1% impacts a portfolio, we ran a couple of, of simulations where you allocate that 1% or 3% or more in a traditional 60-40 portfolio that's allocated to uh, bonds and uh, and equities. And I apologize here, this is this is US centric here with the with the allocations here um, in this in this analysis. But it's a similar story if you start to think about global equities within it and switch the Russell 3000 here with the MSCI world. Um, but the, the impacts here to a portfolio for taking, say, a small allocation of Bitcoin is really a historically, you know, a significant increase in your annualized return with, you know, a moderate, a, a moderate increase in volatility leading to a more a higher sharp ratio. Uh, and if you're taking a really small, I'll say, tracking error versus the index, that, you know, like that one or three percent allocation, you can see that information ratio increase by quite a bit. So you're not necessarily, uh, quote unquote, risking your job as a as a manager by by making these these allocations in this small range, because you can see the max drawdown changes quite insignificantly during this during the, the crypto winters and whatnot. So. These are some of the conversations we have and what's going to happen when we think about this adoption, it will take some time before people uh, within the uh, that are managing those that retirement AUM to begin to make these allocations because they have to have these conversations with their clients have, and these products have to get approved on their platforms before they can even think about, you know, purchasing it. Right now, it's you know obviously available to retail investors in the U.S. So I haven't checked the volumes yet because now that the market's been open for for a, a couple hours, but I would I would expect there'd be you know some action there. Um, but nonetheless, the key thing is it's, it opens up the door for this retire this institutional retirement AUM. So to kind of shift into we talked a little bit about the or the the adoption being a positive. Um, a positive impact. There's also a few things in the technical side, and I'll have to kind of move uh, quite quickly here, uh, given the time constraints. But the first thing is we also have to keep in mind that the next halving event is slated for May of this year. So when historically, when we look at Bitcoin halving, you've seen the majority of the price appreciation take place in the within the time period of one year following the halving, which is exactly what this chart shows. 
you know, since the first and second and third, over the first, second and third having generally the actual appreciation and value has, um, has you know, declined quite a bit, but you're still looking at um, even the second having, uh, you're looking at a four times price uh, appreciation within 337 or so days. So roughly a, a little over a year uh, from the actual having. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, if you're a, if you're somebody that's looking at, uh, you know, blockchain miners, that's something to be mindful of as this puts some pressure on miners that are then going to have to manage the fact that they're going to have probably similar energy costs as they did, you know, before the, before the halving, but now are re receiving uh, less of an actual uh, block reward. Uh, so we have to obviously keep in mind that balance that or that equilibrium that will result after the halving. Shifting to uh, Ethereum and smart contract platforms, something to be mindful of and that is exciting uh, to look ahead to is the Ethereum Gen Kuhn up upgrade, which is slated for Q1 2024. There's a few um, other, you know, important dates there for the test nets that could, you know, delay, potentially delay this if there's any uh, problems in the deployments on those test nets. Uh, but the key thing here is this enables proto dank sharding, which essentially reduces the cost of data availability or transactions for layer twos, uh, such as Arbitrum, Optimism, and Base that are out there, and there are others. But the key thing here is this really enables the next wave of killer applications to be developed on Ethereum, as as we as we've seen in the historical major bull runs. It was there was an aspect of that bull market that incorporated a killer application, whether it was you know an ICO or if it was DeFi in the last two major waves. The next one will have to have another killer application. Maybe that will be fueled by you know better UIs that enable the broader you know uh, broader population to access crypto directly on chain. Or it might be another thing that you know we haven't quite thought uh, I haven't thought of yet. Um, these are important things to be mindful of as we start to think about the next wave. Um, not necessarily making any claims for 2024 being the start of that, but uh, there are interesting developments in the technical space that could lead to that. Um, so that's that's all I have for you guys. I wanted to kind of just highlight a little bit of the macro, the technical, and kind of just talk about what could be you know, an interesting and exciting year ahead if things align. Um, but with that, I'll wrap and pass back to uh, Fernando. Thank you, Blake. I have a question for you. Um, reading the information about the ATF uh, approval process, one detail that caught my attention was that there has been a lot of negotiation with the Security Exchange Commission about redemption in kind or redemption in cash. Now, usually for large investors, I mean, you can subscribe ETF in kind and you can only redeem ETF in kind. But instead, here, uh, there has been negotiation about allowing redemption in cash, which, from what I do understand, is just to allow banks to basically invest in ETF by passing any... Uh, Bank of International Settlement or regulatory risk-weighted uh, um, capital allocation when it comes to investing to Bitcoin. Am I right? Am I wrong? Is that a, a small details that has been kind of underlooked or overlooked or whatever? I think that's an. I think that's definitely an important detail, and I would admit that I'm not going to be the best person on the team to answer that. Our capital markets is the experts there. But I would say that the the, the cash uh, redemption creation process, uh, you know, from what I've heard, may or may not be uh, less efficient. So that could lead to wider spreads in the actual product itself uh, versus in kind. But um, but I don't have a view necessarily on the, you know what you said there with with the banking system. Okay. Any question from the audience? No, so we move to the panel. Thank you, Blake, for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.